And Herschel students are so smart. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome. I'm Susan Bryson, a professor in the philosophy department at Dartmouth, and I am just so excited to welcome you to the Stephen R. Voke Class of 57 Lecture, which is part of a series of distinguished lectures established in 2004 by friends and colleagues honoring Stephen Volk. This lecture is also the culminating event in the 2022 Law Day celebration at Dartmouth. Um, and it's sponsored by the Rockefeller Center and is co-sponsored with the Dartmouth Lawyers Association and the Dartmouth Legal Studies faculty group. I want to say particular thanks to Justin Barabas, director of the Rockefeller Center, Joanne Blay, wherever she is, program officer for public programs and special events, and Herschel Knockless, uh, <laughs> uh, who is research assistant professor of government, public, po public policy, fellow at the Rockefeller Center, and this year's convener of the Legal Studies faculty group. Uh, Professor Knockless will be moderating the Q&A after the lecture. Law Day is an annual event started by the American Bar Association to celebrate the role of law in our society and to cultivate a deeper understanding of the legal profession. This year's theme is Toward a More Perfect Union, the Constitution in Times of Change. I know everybody says this sort of thing when introducing a speaker, but I really mean this when I say I can think of no one more qualified to address us on this occasion than Judge Beth Robinson, who was appointed to the United States Court of Appeals for the Second Circuit in November 2021. Judge Robinson graduated summa cum laude from Dartmouth with a philosophy major, I might add. Uh, and received her law degree from the University of Chicago, after which she clerked for Judge David Centelier of the U.S. Court of Appeals for the D.C. Circuit, and then practiced law at Langrock, Sperry, and Wool in Vermont for 18 years. 
During that time, she was at the very forefront of the movement for marriage equality, mainly in Vermont, but also across the country. She served as co-counsel with Susan Murray in Baker versus State, the landmark case resulting in the first civil union law in the United States. I had the great good fortune of being able to teach with Judge Robinson twice. Once was in the summer of 1996, no, sorry, 2006, <laughs> and once in the spring of 2009. And that was an especially exciting time to be in the classroom with Judge Robinson because that term, first Vermont and then New Hampshire, legalized same-sex marriage. And this was to a great extent as a result of the enormous efforts of Judge Robinson. I was hoping to continue teaching with Judge Robinson, you know, for years to come. And then, um, <laughs> Vermont Governor Peter Shumlin selected her to serve as his counsel. And it was just about a year or so afterwards that she was appointed Associate Justice of the Vermont Supreme Court. And she served in this position for nearly a decade before being confirmed last November 1st by the U.S. Senate to be a judge on the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Second Circuit. I want to just give you a heads up about um, the format because some people are viewing this online via Zoom, I believe, and we also have a wonderful in-person audience. Uh, so what we will do um, after Judge Robinson presents her talk is allow field questions from the in-person audience, but also uh, encourage and welcome questions from the online audience. And what you will need to do to get your question considered <laughs> is email Rocky Q and A at Dartmouth.edu. And I'll ask Professor Knockless to repeat that again when he gets up here, but Rocky Q and A, all one word, at Dartmouth.edu. Uh, but for now, please join me. Oh, first I want to mention that the, <laughs> I'm just so excited that Judge Robinson is here. I'm sorry, forgive me, but this is a real thrill. It's, she has made such a big difference in my life and in the lives of so many people I know. And we're just so very lucky to have you here in our midst to give a lecture on courts, myths, and the foundation of liberty exploring misperceptions about judging and the threat to our independent judiciary. Please join me in welcoming Judge Beth Robinson. Thank you. Thank you so much. You're so nice. You're so nice. You're so nice. And I have to say, one of my funnest experiences at Dartmouth has been teaching with uh, Professor Bryson, not once, but twice. So thank you. I'm actually going to, would people be okay if I took this off? No. Um, yeah. I think. That way, if I make a deadpan joke, you maybe will know it's a joke, and otherwise, <laughs> it'll be an awkward pause. Um, I'm thrilled to be here. It's been a great day so far. Thank you all for bringing me. Thanks to the folks at Rocky. Uh, thanks to the Dartmouth Lawyers Association and the Dartmouth Legal Studies faculty group. Uh, Professor Knockless, thanks for bringing me to your class and for your role in bringing me here today. Um, it's just It's been a wonderful day, and I'm so impressed by the students that I've had the opportunity to engage with so far. So thank you. Thank you all very much. I, uh, I was laughing to myself when Professor Bryson was reading the title of this, um, this talk because I had a conversation with some friends a couple days ago and I um, said, yeah, it's a little bit ponderous. And I told them the title and they said, oh, good golly, who came up with that? <laughs> and I had to admit it was me. I think they just assumed that somebody had assigned the title. But as I was actually gathering my thoughts to prepare for today, I came to regret the title um, because it's just so big. Uh, and so epic, and, and I don't think I can do it justice. So if I were to rename the talk right now, I would call it You Be the Judge. My goal here today um, is fairly modest, but um, hopefully a modest goal is attainable. I'd like to give you all a little bit of a flavor of what sort of the real world of day-to-day -day judging, and I'm talking about the interpreting the law part, not the deciding the facts part, uh, looks like, uh, because I think that might shed some light on our broader conversations about um, about judging and what judges do. I'm going to do it through some cases that I think will be very accessible to all of you, um, and hopefully that'll make it uh, less painful than uh, getting into some of the dry stuff that I admit I sometimes have to work with. 
from time to time. Judges should interpret and apply the law as it is. It is not the role of judges to make law. How many people have heard this before? Right? Like person on the street interviews, polls. I can personally tell you from experience, Senate confirmation hearings. Um, it, 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 it's a refrain we hear a lot. Um, and uh, it's important. But my thesis today is that this, it, well, let me ask you before I tell you my thesis. How many people agree with that? Yeah, that's sort of right, right? Close enough. My thesis is that while it, it's truthy, <laughs> there are large swaths of the law in which it's simply wrong. And there are other swaths of the law in which it's a combination of utterly uninteresting and also somewhat lacking in nuance. So I'm going to talk about the first, the swaths of law in which it's just utterly wrong, because it's sort of the forgotten corner of the law. You can see this detour that we're taking. And the detour ends in a building that will mean nothing to anybody but maybe one or two of you in the room. But that's the Vermont Supreme Court. It could be any state court building, because uh, I'm taking us to the world of state courts. And the reason I'm taking us to the world of state courts is that the common law is an area of substantive law that lives almost exclusively in our state courts. But it's a big swath of the law. If you think about things like contract law, tort law, property law, and let me back up. People know what the common law is. The common law is judge-made law that came from England, that existed before we did, and that judges in state courts across the country have evolved over time to meet evolving needs, evolving sensibilities, uh, new issues. And it's a field of, of law that is um, by design, judge-made and judge-evolved, unless and until legislatures see fit to step in and modify the law in their own right, which they're free to do and, and often do do. I want to give you just one example do do was kind of a funny thing when it came out of my mouth. I don't know if anybody else thought that. <laughs> I was like distracted myself. Um, so I'm going to give you an example. Oh, actually, this, oh, I'm not going to let you see this. If you forget what you just saw, because when I talk about state courts being kind of a forgotten corner um, uh, of the law, I think we often focus on federal courts. We especially focus on the US Supreme Court. How many people think there are more cases in federal court than state courts? How many people think they're about the same? How many people think there are twice as many cases in the state court as federal courts? <laughs> Nobody's going to raise their hand for any of these. So let me, let me, just, let me just tell you, give you the numbers. If you look at this, this is 2021 federal filings in civil and criminal courts. You'll see a total of about under, under a million, right? You look at state court filings in the same period of time, you're looking at upwards of 24 million, right? The vast majority of the law in our country comes from state courts. And it, and it happens at the state level. And I want to flag that for folks, because I, I think that uh, that puts this common law thing in a little bit more perspective. This dog, this is, I'm using this case partly because I've read that seeing cute dogs gives audiences a dopamine hit, and it makes them enjoy lectures more. <laughs> um, so we'll see whether that's true. But this dog, which is really a file photo, uh, looks just like the dog that is the subject of this case, who's either named Max or Boy, depending on your perspective. So let me tell you the story of Max or Boy. Zane owned a dog, Boy, had the dog for a few years. Dog was his constant companion. And one day, uh, dog, Boy, disappears. Zane hangs signs on the you know, telephone poles in the area, calls the Humane Society, says, I've lost my dog, uh, does what he can to try to find his dog. No luck. Meanwhile, around the same time, Mary finds a lost dog. She hangs signs in the general stores and the parks in the area. She also calls the Humane Society. It's not clear to me, but for whatever reason, the Humane Society never made the connection. She puts ads on the radio, and she makes an effort to find the family for this dog, whom she names Max. No luck. 14 months pass. Max, at this point, is fully a member of her family. It's her best friend by her own account. And one day, somebody's delivering wood to Mary, drives in the driveway, sees a dog, goes back and tells his friend Zane, I think I saw a boy in this woman's driveway. So Zane comes back in his truck, sees the dog, opens the door, says, hey, boy. Dog jumps in the truck, Zane closes the door and drives off. And we have ourselves a case heading to the Vermont Supreme Court over who owns that dog. OK? Now, 
the common law at the time, and property law, I'm, I'm gonna oversimplify, I've oversimplified the facts, I'm gonna, I'm gonna take some liberties with the law as well just to make this work better. But the point, I think, I'm close enough. I'm close enough. So the common law at the time had two principles that were relevant to resolution of this case. One principle was that animals, whether they be domestic, domestic companion animals or any other kind of animal, are property. They are property that have the same, are subject to the same legal regime as this pen, as this clicker, um, as my iPhone. Um, they're subject to the generic common law of property. The second proposition from the common law of property, many of you may have learned on the playground as a kid, but you learned it wrong. What you learned on the playground as a kid is finders, keepers, losers, weepers. Do you remember that? So the common law is sort of, or was sort of finders, keepers, losers, weepers. It was finders, keepers, losers, weepers, except as against the original rightful owner. So if I find a wristwatch on the side of the road, I get to keep it. Nobody else can dispossess me of that wristwatch uh, on a superior claim of right, except for the person whose watch it was. So those were the two common law principles that would apply to this scenario. But the common law being by design, judge-made, and flexible to accommodate to new, um, to new scenarios, if you left the common law exactly as it was, Zane wins, Zane gets the dog. A creative young lawyer made the following argument to the Vermont Supreme Court as to why they should evolve the common law. One, a domesticated a companion animal is not a piece of property. It is a living sentient being with feelings and interests of its own. As a consequence, you should ensure that your common law rules dealing with lost companion animals are rules that are designed to promote the well-being of those animals as well as fairness to the people who develop the relationships with or own in the, in, in the frame of the law those animals. So when you're dealing with a lost dog, you want a common law rule that says if you find the lost dog, you have to take reasonable steps to, to find the rightful owner of the dog. But at some point, if you've done all the right things and you don't find the rightful owner, you have some promise that the dog can become yours. And that gives you an incentive to invest in uh, veterinary uh, expenses, uh, to take care of the dog, to feed the dog, to love the dog, to make the dog your own. Um, that was the argument. How many people here buy it? Not very many. I gotta say, I'm taking it personally. I was the creative young lawyer who made that argument, just for the, <laughs> just for the record. Uh, it, was, it was in the early 90s. It was one of my first cases. Well, fortunately, I had, uh, I had a little bit better luck with the Vermont Supreme Court than I had with this room. So the court basically said, or ordinary common law, now there's a statutory piece of this that I'm, I'm, I'm dropping for now, don't provide a useful framework for resolving disputes over lost pets. Instead, courts must have fashion and apply rules that recognize their unique status. This proposition, by the way, and this is a sort of another way, uh, example of how the law develops, became integral to subsequent decisions dealing with custody dispute over the family pet in a divorce. Uh, it became integral to discussion of search and seizure issues involving um, uh, animals, uh, domestic animals as the subject of a search. So this proposition had um, uh, ripple effects far beyond the particular scenario of the lost dog in Zane versus Mary. And the court basically adopted the rule that, and it was 3-2, this was a split court, uh, where the finder of a lost pet makes a reasonable effort to locate the owner and responsibly cares for the animal over a reasonably extensive period of time, the finder may acquire possession of the animal. So um, notwithstanding all the naysayers in this room, at least in the law of the land in Vermont, uh, is that our common law has evolved. Um, I wanted to, to highlight this issue because it is an area of the law where um, I want people to understand that judges have a role in evolving the law and developing the law that's entirely appropriate. It's not inappropriate activism. Um, it's development of the common law. It's one of the really fun things about being a state court judge. All right, we're going back to the main road. The main road is where we're going to look at the law, and this is both in state courts and in federal courts. Uh, the other two main sources of law between, besides common law are statutes and the Constitution. Now there's sort of, I, I think regulations are sort of a subsidiary or an adjunct of statutes. So statutes, regulations, and the Constitution. All of those areas of law involve, to some extent, interpreting and an applying texts. Now most cases, the texts are obvious, and they don't go to court, or they certainly don't get up to an appeals court. So the cases that we get, the more interesting cases, are cases where uh, the law doesn't clearly resolve uh, a, a, a vexing question, 
and, and the court has to, has to figure out how, uh, how the text applies to a given fact. I'm going to start with a law. This was a statute in Vermont. It makes it a crime to possess a slung shot, which is not a slingshot. It was, it was new to me. The, the, the picture there in the middle is a flail, which is apparently like a slung shot, uh, blackjack or brass knuckles, and that's sort of uh, the sort of archetype, archetype brass knuckles. I don't know if people are familiar with these tools. Uh, but it's, it's a crime to possess them uh, with an intent to use. The question that came to the Vermont Supreme Court was whether this implement and possession of this implement with an intent to use it violated the prohibition against possessing brass knuckles. This is the case of the undefined term. It, there's a lot of cases that you get um, in statutory interpretation that involve an undefined term. So the question is, what makes something brass knuckles? One thing that I can tell you pretty clearly is not what makes something brass knuckles is that it's made of brass. Um, despite the fact that the plain languages seem to suggest that the metal uh, that it's formed from uh, is, is essential to the definition, I, I, I didn't ever encounter any cases that concluded that brass knuckles must be made of bra brass. So what is the essence of brass knuckles, and how do you figure it out if it's not defined? So the first place you might look is a dictionary. And I'll tell you what the dictionary had to say. Uh, the dictionary said, brass knuckles are gripped in a clenched fist, it fits over the knuckles. It's designed to increase damage from the strike of a fist. Now, this implement was, that's how this implement was used. It did have the blades in the side, but you put your, you put your fingers through that middle area, and that jagged thing in the top was designed to create uh, maximum impact uh, if you punched somebody with it. So then the question is, okay, does that make these brass knuckles? What about the fact that there aren't individual rings around each finger? We looked at case law from other states. We didn't have any Vermont case law, and there was a case that said, well, Brass knuckles, the question is whether when it comes into the contact with the victim's body used in a punching fashion, uh, and whether it's designed readily to be used offensively against the human body, and whether the design can't readily be put to other purposes. Okay, so that's helpful. You might look at the origin of the statute. What, what was the statute designed to do? Well, it turns out that, that all we could find is that at the time they were targeting the weapons that were commonly used by criminal syndicates, organized crime, mafia. Um, and so these were, these were apparently the, the, the weapons I showed you on the last screen were apparently weapons of choice um, for, for those folks. And you might think about something called the rule of lenity. In the criminal law, if you're going to prosecute somebody, you shouldn't send them to jail or otherwise uh, limit their liberty on account of a law that they couldn't clearly know in advance prohibited the conduct. Um, so you'd have to decide whether, you know, if you're, if you're really on the fence about whether these are brass knuckles, that might, that might be a deciding vote. So I've kind of given you everything, really, that we had in front of us to decide this case. So now I'm going to ask you to be the judge. How many people here think those are brass knuckles? How many people here think that the defendant should be acquitted because he didn't violate the statute? In other words, they're not brass knuckles or, or you're applying the rule of lenity. OK. Now, the point isn't who's right and who's wrong. Uh, the point is that there's a room full of people of goodwill and thoughtful faced with a vexing legal issue, and we had a range of different answers. And I can assure you that half of the room is not a bunch of crazy judicial activists imposing your own policy preferences while the others are you know, getting the law right. This was a vexing problem. And for what it's worth, the Vermont Supreme Court concluded that these were, in fact, brass knuckles. And it was actually a unanimous decision, but it didn't have to be. Now I'm going to give you a different kind of uh, problem. There's no undefined terms in this one. Um, it has to do with thinking about a statute and how it plays out in its context um, and, and the consequences. As you can see, you're looking at a picture of a pine-scented air freshener hanging from a rearview mirror. How many people have these in your cars? <laughs> or something like it. OK. Well, here was the law in Vermont that we were interpreting. I'm not going to read the whole thing, but it's entitled Obstructing Windshields. No person shall hang any object other than a rearview mirror in back of the windshield. The question was whether an individual could be pulled over for having the pine scented air freshener, which was an object hanging in the back of the windshield, namely hanging from the rearview mirror. Now, this was actually an incredibly important case, not because there was a spate of ticket writing for pine scented air fresheners, but because the law is that if the police observe you violating any motor vehicle law, 
they can pull you over. They can restrain your liberty to that extent. And it turns out that once they pull you over, all sorts of other things can happen. So I don't even think that the defendant in this case, I don't think the defendant in this case got a ticket for the Pine Senate air freshener. I think the defendant in this case, if I recall, got cited for driving under the influence. Um, but we had to determine the validity of the stop. And in order to determine, determine the validity of the stop, we had to determine whether uh, the air freshener violated the statute. So let me give you some pros and cons. And again, you can be the judge. I think the biggest pro for the state in this prosecution is the literal meaning of the words that I've highlighted in red. Right? That seems pretty broad. It seems pretty absolute. Let me tell you some of the article arguments for the defendant. First is the heading, obstructing windshields. The argument would be that this statute is by its terms about obstructions. And unless you determine that the thing that's hanging is a significant obstruction of some sort to your vision, this statute doesn't and shouldn't be interpreted to purport to reach to it. And that invokes both the language and the purpose of the statute, right? It's a public safety statute. The argument would be there's no public safety purpose in trying to reach things that don't actually impair your vision. Um, gets tougher with fuzzy dice. And I can tell you, having, having read like the fuzzy dice cases and the Pine Senate air fresher cases from around the country, as you get bigger, <laughs> you, 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 get more, you get more obstructions. And believe me, there's a whole body of fuzzy dice law uh, out there. It's uh, one of the fun things about this case. Another bit of, another, another few facts to think about. One is, uh, I think 48 other states in their statutes specifically say nor hang any object, they use different words, but nor hang, nor hang any object that obstructs the vision. One state, Minnesota, has this absolute language and applies it that way. Now you could go both ways with that piece of information, right? You could say, well, if all the other states saw fit to put in very precise language that didn't apply broadly, that limited it to things that actually obstruct your vision, uh, then Vermont, not having done that, must have seen fit to go the Minnesota route. Or you could see an argument that said that the overwhelming consensus in our sister states is that the focus of these laws is things that actually impair your vision. I guess the other, other factors to think about is think about the practical impact. Think about your parking permit that's hanging from your rearview mirror, your garage door opener that extends beyond the edge of your window, your hands-free mic that uh, is mounted somewhere in the car behind the windshield. Um, you could imagine practical applications of the broad literal reading that would be far beyond what you can imagine the legislature really intended. And you can imagine a real constitutional shadow uh, overhanging your consideration if you're deciding that the statute means something that, that, that essentially authorizes the police to pull over probably 60% of the cars that they see uh, for no reason other than something hanging from their, their, their windshield. But it's a tough one because judges aren't supposed to make law, right? And so the, one of the questions, this is, this is a little bit of a test of how, what that means in terms of how literal, uh, how literal you are in looking at specific words versus the broader context versus things like the headings. How many people think that the Pine Senate air freshener, that, that you would conclude that this statute applies and uh, you can be pulled over for the Pine Senate air freshener? How many people think that the statute is properly construed to apply to objects that obstruct, that, that, that have some significant or, uh, yeah, let's say significant, significantly obstruct your view? OK, that's interesting. Uh, it, again, um, I don't know who the activists here are and who the not, but, but, but uh, thoughtful people can, I've, I've given you basically what we had to work with. Thoughtful people can disagree. Um, the Vermont Supreme, oops, we're going to, the Vermont Supreme Court actually, again, unanimously um, ruled that the, the uh, narrower interpretation applied, that it, it, it had to obstruct. Um, and what's interesting about this, one of the great things about statutory interpretation is if you get it wrong, the legislature can fix it. That's different from, you know, constitutional interpretation is a little trickier. But if you get it wrong, the legislature can fix it. Well, the Vermont legislature went in in response to this case, and they codified it, right? So that was at least some sense that maybe, maybe we got it right. Um, the legislature um, added the significant obstruction to the language. 
Those are some examples of statutory interpretation. And I'm, I'm just mostly offering them to give you some taste of the kinds of challenges we face uh, when we're trying to figure out how, what a statute means in a, in a scenario that wasn't contemplated. You get into constitutional interpretation, it's a whole other ballgame, right? The provisions of our Constitution, especially our Bill of Rights, are by design uh, broad. There are very few words. They apply generally. They sound sort of absolute. Most of them are, aren't, don't in, contain within them uh, conditions on their application. And so we're going to look at the First Amendment free speech. Congress shall make no law abridging the freedom of speech. And the question is, OK, we've got a large body of law that answers questions about existing categories of speech. Um, let's talk about a relatively new, or at least a relatively newly recognized category of speech. Um, Vermont Supreme Court, in, a, in an opinion uh, in the Van Buren case, called it non-consensual pornography. You may know it colloquially as revenge porn, right? The scenario that you could imagine is the, um, the ex who uploads a, a sex tape that was taken with an expectation of privacy after a breakup in order to cause um, hurt, harm, and shame uh, to, the, to their former partner, right? And there are actually whole websites devoted to providing a forum for the display of this kind of um, material. So in the teens, states all around the country, and frankly, I think it was largely in response to some great um, research and, and writing done by folks in scholarship, uh, identifying the problem and identifying the harm, and states around the country enacted laws. And I suspect this is going to be something that Professor Bryson knows far more about than I do, given, given her, her area of study. Um, they passed these laws that made it a crime. Now, this is, this is Vermont's law, which is the one that is the subject of this case. Made it a crime to knowingly disclose a visual image of an identifiable person who's nude or engaged in sexual conduct without his or her consent, with the intent to harm, harass, intimidate, threaten, or coerce the person depicted, and the disclosure would cause a reasonable person to suffer harm. There were a couple of other limitations built into the statute. One is it excluded circumstances where the images were created in a circumstance where there was no reasonable expectation of privacy. If I stripped down in the middle of a public park on a busy day, uh, I can't now claim privacy in the distribution of that, that tape because I, it wasn't reasonable for me to expect privacy in that. Um, you also, it's also excluded uh, disclosures that were concerned matters of public interest. Um, you could imagine a situation where you might have um, a strong public interest in a particular tape, not as a matter of causing harm to the the X, uh, but as a matter of um, other aspects of what's depicted. The question faced the Vermont Supreme Court is, is this constitutional? Is this statute on its face constitutional? If a statute um, reaches, there's sort of two different questions, as applied and in general. Let's obscure that distinction and say just in general, is it unconstitutional as a general matter to prohibit this speech? And not only prohibit it, but criminalize it. And remember, here's the, here's the Constitution. Now, the first thing I hope you notice is that if you look at the Constitution and then you look at this statute, that's probably not enough for you to answer the question that I just posed, right? You probably want to know a lot more because the Constitution, as an amazing a document it is, is, is not necessarily self-executing in the context of a particular case. Fortunately, we have. 200 plus years of case law that have not answered the specific question, but have given us a framework for evaluating the question. So the first thing you might ask is, is this speech? There may be all sorts of debate about it, but let's assume that it's pretty clear that this is speech. You're actually, in, in the scenario that we're using, let's assume um, in that particular case, it was a posting on Facebook, right? So let's assume that, that, that we all agree it's speech. So then the question is, is it protected speech? You might think, based on this broad language of the First Amendment, that if it's speech, that ends the conversation. Because it says Congress shall make no law abridging the freedom of speech. But as it turns out, over the ensuing years since the Constitution was enacted, the US Supreme Court has identified various categories of speech that are essentially excluded, categorically excluded, from the protections of the First Amendment. So the next question you're going to ask is, 
whether this fits in one of the established categories. Eh, it may. It's a close cousin to, it could be a close cousin to obscenity, depending on the content of the tape, but it's not necessarily. Um, there may be some, some, some historical limitations, um, exclusions around speech that invades privacy. It's also a tough fit. Um, let's assume, but again, all of this is a little more complicated, that it's not a perfect, perfect fit in an existing category. Then the next question is, should we create a new category? Maybe, maybe. I think ultimately the creation of new categories is probably going to fall to the US Supreme Court. At least in this case, the Vermont Supreme Court didn't see fit to take it upon itself to create a new category. The US Supreme Court's made it pretty clear they're not excited about the creation of new categories. Um, so you might present some reasons why uh, this is an area of speech that's quite concerning. Um, but at least in this case, the court stopped short of creating a new category. Is it content-based? I forgot to ask that. Is the prohibition against speech based on the content of the speech? Yes. In this case, it's absolutely based on what, what the pictures are of. Having gone through all those hurdles, the test then that applies is essentially what we call strict scrutiny. And there are two aspects to strict scrutiny. And you'll see strict scrutiny as a, as a motif throughout the law in various constitutional applications. Um, but in the, in the First Amendment context, that there's two things you're going to look at. How strong is the state's interest? Is it a compelling state interest? Um, and how close is the fit between the tools that the state has used this law to regulate this area of speech and the harm that it's trying to address. So in, in the context of strict scrutiny, it's got to be a compelling interest, and it's got to be narrowly tailored. The statute's got to be narrowly tailored. Now we get to the point where we need to be the judge. And when I say we need to be the judge, we're getting pretty close to the point where um, existing precedent and frameworks um, are of increasingly limited help in, in our ultimate decision. Because we have to decide as judges, is this interest compelling? And we have data. We have all sorts of compelling presentations about the impact of these kinds of disclosures uh, on the individuals, uh, primarily but not exclusively women, who are depicted uh, and often uh, shamed and embarrassed in their, in their broader lives. Um, We've got data about suicidality resulting from this kind of conduct. Um, we've got all sorts of other data. So we have to decide whether the state has a compelling interest in regulating this, a sufficiently compelling interest that we're, we're going to tolerate such regulations, notwithstanding our overarching commitment to the freedom of speech. And then we have to decide whether this statute is narrow enough in its targeting that it's not sweeping in all sorts of stuff that we actually think should be protected. That's the narrowly tailored part. Just curious, how many people think the statute is constitutional based, in other words, that it supports a compelling interest that's narrowly tailored and that, and that it's narrowly tailored as I've described it to you? How many people think it's unconstitutional? Wow, OK. This is actually the only case that I'm talking about today where the court was split, interestingly. Uh, it was split 4-1, uh, and the court did conclude that it was constitutional. And again, the point of my using this example is not to tell you this was right or wrong. Um, but to me, this is a great example of, of, of the place where the road of precedent and clear guidance um, sort of peters out and the realm of judgment um, steps in. And, and uh, I think it supports my thesis that at some level, in some of these tough cases, judges have to exercise judgment. So that's one example. I could obviously do many. I want to leave plenty of time for conversation. Um, but I, I want to sort of, uh, balls and strikes to people. How many people here know what this reference is, the balls and strikes reference? Um, it was popularized by now Chief Justice Roberts in his confirmation hearings many years ago. And I think it was, it was, it, he was describing the role of judges as calling balls and strikes. And there's an aspect of that uh, metaphor that's, that's incredibly on point, right? The aspect that's incredibly on point is that judges like umpires show up for the game. They call the 
pitches as they come in, and, and they're not committed to any particular outcome. They're not there because they want one team or another to win. They're there as neutral adjudicators. And I think in that sense, and I think that's maybe the main sense in which Justice Roberts, now Justice Roberts intended it, uh, I think it's a good metaphor. What's deceptive about it from my perspective, uh, or incomplete, is that the strike zone is clearly defined. And you can have a machine call balls and strikes. I know that the major, the, the major leagues are actually experimenting with machines now to call balls and strikes. And I submit to you that there's an element of judgment in the kinds of cases that I've showed you uh, where the judges are not only deciding where did the ball fall, but where the what the strike zone is, what the legal rules are that apply. Um, I think it's a little bit more nuanced than the... Um, than what I said before. Now, how does this tie back to the title? I, felt, I feel like I need to do something to connect this talk to the title of what I said you were going to come to. Um, I'm not going to spend a ton of time tying it back together, but I'll say one, courts matter. The independence and neutrality of the courts matter. We all know the big epic struggles between the branches and the, and the, and the hedge against authoritarianism that courts provide. Uh, I submit that in the ordinary bread and butter cases, the other 99.9% .9 of the cases, courts also matter. It matters that we have an independent and neutral body adjudicating disputes among ourselves and disputes in which the government is a party on the other side and we have judges who aren't beholden to the elected branches in, in, in the federal system and in many states not beholden to the voters but are able to decide those, those uh, decisions without fear uh, of, of, of repercussions on the political side. Um, our respect for the courts and our understanding of what they do is critical to their effectiveness as an independent and neutral uh, judiciary because we don't have armies that, that go out and enforce our edicts. We don't control the purse strings. What makes a court decision effective, for the most part, is our collective social agreement that we're going to follow it. And if that starts crumbling, then the foundation of the rule of law is very much in trouble. That, by the way, the, the, the connection to the slide is that he's trying to get the dog to do something, and the dog doing that depends on the dog's uh, willingness to obey the guy. Um, it, it, it's kind of a rough hit. I wanted to get, get another dopamine hit from a dog in making this point uh, before, I, before I end my remarks. But um, to me, the more you understand about what judges do, in, especially in the 99.9% .9 of the cases that don't involve the... Um, challenging ideological rifts that um, sort of define our contemporary society. Um, I think the more people understand what judges do, the less likely we will fall into the trap uh, of saying those judges are just activists who are interpreting the law the way they want to, um, which I think is an invitation to move in the direction of not respecting and following the decisions of the courts. So that might be the connection between the talk I just gave and the title that lured you in here. Um, but I do hope you understand a little bit more um, about how courts work based on your wonderful adjudication of a handful of cases. So um, thank you. And I guess we'll maybe slip into questions. Does that make sense? <laughs> uh, thank you. That is something they indeed want to do uh, following, following your talk. Um, I'm just going to ask a quick question or two and then turn it over uh, to, to the audience, um, given the time. And, and I apologize if, if the first one seems a little bit, a, a little bit un, unfair. Uh-oh. <laughs> OK. Which is, um, it, it strikes many people that a great way for the public to understand the work of the judiciary during arguments and deliberations would, to prov would be to provide the public uh, closer access to those things via, via video of, of some sort. And this is a very controversial subject. I'm just wondering if you think that would help ameliorate some of the problems you've described or just make them worse. Interesting. You know, it, I mean, COVID really gave us a laboratory for evaluating this in, in, in Vermont. And I was on the Vermont Supreme Court up until quite recently. We quickly transitioned to, uh, in our appellate court, our Supreme Court, 
uh, we don't have an intermediate appellate court in Vermont. So our Supreme Court um, transitioned to all remote arguments, and they were on video, and they were live streamed. And they're now sitting there on uh, the court's YouTube channel, every argument that's taken place since COVID began. Um, I don't know how well they're used. I personally think it was great. I think it, it's, it, it was an opportunity for me to sometimes, you know, if I'd have a high school student who was sort of doing a mini internship, I'd tell them about the case in advance and then they could watch it or they could go back and watch it later. Um, I think it was wonderful. That's not the practice in the federal system, although um, the audio is available publicly um, for the cases, at least that I've been involved in so far, unless they, they happen to be argued sort of under seal. Um, and I think that's also been true for United States Supreme Court arguments during COVID in terms of the audio being available. So, you know, I don't want to stick my neck out and talk about what the federal courts should do. I haven't been there long enough to form an opinion. But I will say that um, I think it has worked well in the state court. And I think uh, I, I, can't, I can't disagree with the proposition that as a general matter, um, promoting access to these uh, kinds of arguments is a helpful thing. One more quick question, and, and then I'll turn it over to, to everyone here. Um, most difficult or most interesting uh, transition, career transition, advocate to judge, uh, state judge to federal judge, or just to throw a third in there, uh, Indiana to Hanover? Ah, um, you know, advocate to judge was a pretty big, it was a pretty big transition. I think what, what ultimately happened is I found myself directing my advocate um, juices towards a passion for the rule of law that was compatible with my role as a judge. And so I, I carried through my work the same sense of mission that drove me as an advocate, but it was, it was like an area where it was okay for me to do that as a judge. But it took a while to get there, and it's a very, um, it's a very, a little bit lonely, that sounds like woe is me, but, but, but you know, when you're used to clients and, and, or engaging the political realm and you're dealing with lots of people all the time and then you become an appellate judge as opposed to a trial court judge, you suddenly find yourself spending a lot of time alone with your you know, reading and writing. And, and that was personally very challenging for me. I, I, I spent my first couple of years just telling myself that I didn't have to do this forever. And then at some point, <laughs> I... At some point, I realized I was loving it. Um, so, yeah. Let's turn it over to the audience. And of course, as is our tradition, uh, first questions come from students. And we will sit here as long as, as it takes for bashful students to raise their hand. Victor, thanks for not being bashful. Yeah, that's an interesting question. I don't know if everybody heard, but it's sort of how do you weigh the, ad, do you wait for those arguments to come to you or do you go off and, 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 and come up with them on your own? And I think it's a mix. I think you have to be careful as a judge going too far, straying too far from the arguments that are, as they're actually presented because there may be reasons why they weren't presented and you might find yourself <clears throat> wandering into to areas that you don't fully understand. On the other hand, if you're making law that's going to apply beyond this case, if you're interpreting a statute and, and the way you interpret it is going to affect all sorts of people who aren't there in court, my own view is that you shouldn't let a less than fully effective lawyer uh, lead you to reach conclusions that you might not otherwise reach. So I always felt that it was my responsibility within the general frame of the cases presented to make sure that um, a decision was legally sound. Uh, and, and that might involve pulling some of the tools out of the toolbox that a particular lawyer didn't. You know, if they, if they failed to cite the key precedent, like the case, then you're going to still look at the key precedent. You're not going to say, oh, well, the lawyer didn't cite that. 
And you're probably, I think, doing your due diligence, going to want to make sure you're not missing the key precedent. So. Thank you so much. Uh, I'm a young gay woman who will forever be indebted to your earlier work in Baker v. State and other cases to bring legal dignity to the LGBTQ plus people and to, to your dedicated service on the Vermont Supreme Court and the Second Circuit. As someone who aspires to one day become a federal judge, just like you, I still sometimes fear that people will question my neutrality because of my sexual orientation. I wonder if you could speak to how you have navigated this in the state and federal judiciaries. Thanks, and thanks for all of that. It's very flattering. Um, you know, I think in the end, actions speak louder than words. And so my hope is that, you know, the good news is after 10 years in the Vermont Supreme Court, for better or worse, I had a track record. And you could look at it, and you could decide that I wasn't neutral. or you could, I mean, you, you, somebody else is going to have to make that decision. But I stand by my work. And um, I think that's what, that's what matters at the end of the day. Um, yeah, I don't have any more to say on that. I think you just gotta you, you gotta walk the walk. So, given that you're in the second district, which, if I'm right, includes the southern district of New York, um, within your um, your kind of that you oversee. Um, how has the change you described in class as your, your main um, commitment as to defending the rule of law um, as a judge, how has your change from a Vermont Supreme Court justice to uh, inevitably dealing with, uh, you were talking about asylee cases as well as corporate cases, quite possibly cases involving the former president, how has your conception of what the rule of law has changed while you're transitioned from the state Supreme Court to the Second Circuit? Yeah, I mean, I don't think the meaning of rule of law, sort of my conception of what that means changes. The substantive law I'm applying is very different in many cases. Um, so I'm learning all sorts of new areas of law. The federal courts are courts of limited jurisdiction. So I think there are more, um, There are more limitations on the reach of courts. And then I think the biggest difference is when you're in the Vermont Supreme Court, you are the highest court within that jurisdiction on matters of state law. When you're on the Second Circuit Court of Appeals, you are an intermediate court, which means that you are entirely beholden to the United States Supreme Court. That doesn't mean that there aren't going to be places, places where cases present issues that haven't been resolved by the Supreme Court, and then you need to bring the tools out of your own toolbox to try to resolve them. But uh, you, you need to be conscious of all the other circuits and what they're doing, and you need to be conscious of where the US Supreme Court is heading in a sort of general direction. There's various things that inform that that make it feel to me very different from when I was on the highest court within my smaller jurisdiction. There's a quick question from online about the role of, of the media in this translational exercise. Yeah. Um, sort of better and worse examples you've seen of that. And then I might also ask if you could relate that to your experience going through the federal confirmation process, because one, to say nameless colleague of yours that I've spoken about this with, used the word stressful six times over one lunch to, de <laughs> to describe the media role in that process. And I think it's still sort of shocks them to this day. And so the, the media the role in the confirmation process? Yeah. Ah, interesting. You know, I, I, I didn't, I don't have personal experience with sort of the media in the confirmation process. Like that didn't, the media wasn't, didn't become a factor in mine. Um, you know, I didn't have some viral video that got played over and over, things like that. Um, so for me, the stress was really around preparing for the confirmation hearings. Um, so that was, and that was, that was plenty of stress. Like, I didn't need more. Um, but um, what was the other part of that? Uh, the media's role in this translational exercise about judicial efforts. Yeah, I think it's really hard because, you know, the world isn't all lawyers. The media's not lawyers. And so often when we're reporting on cases, it, it's sort of, uh, 
it's very outcome-based reporting for reasons that I understand, but it often boils down to who won and who lost. And often the legal issue in a case has very little to do with like the policy question on the table. And so um, you've got, oh, the court ruled in favor of, you know, Microsoft or, you know, whatever, name the corporation. Um, and, it, and, and I think I worry that the impression that creates it is that the court is sort of deciding between winners and losers and parties rather than parsing some um, obscure, you know, does this or really mean or, or does it mean and or, you know, which is often the, the, kind of what these boil down to. I don't know what the answer to that is. I know that in Vermont, b before COVID hit, we were beginning to work with the Vermont media to try to create cross trainings where we could uh, meet with young lawyers and sort of talk to them about the law and hopefully elevate the sophistication of their reporting. And they could tell us about what they needed as reporters to do their job better. Um, and then COVID hit and that's sort of everything else that hasn't resumed. And I don't know whether the court plans to go down that road, but I think it's a really worthwhile effort. I guess the second thing I'll say is, you know, it's, it's complicated, right? When there's, a, when there's a high profile, and I mentioned this in your class, when there's a high profile sort of controversial case and a court decides it, especially if it's sort of a controversial decision, I, 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 I can't deny that I'm sort of interested in the, that judge's background, but the, the habit of, of immediately associating every judge with who appointed them, I think reinforces this notion that judges are just foot soldiers in a broader partisan battle and, and, and the judiciary is just a different field of battle. And, I, and that's not at all how I see things. Um, and, and, and so that, that's a place where I'd love to see a paradigm shift. Thank you for coming in to speak to us today. Um, your talk was very enjoyable. Um, I had a question about the increased view that the judiciary is a political institution rather than one purely motivated by logic. My first question is whether this is a good thing or a bad thing. Is it good that people understand that justices do bring in their personal backgrounds into cases, or is this a bad thing and people should view the courts as something unmotivated by personal, their personal backgrounds. And my second question is how can we combat this notion that the judiciary is a political institution? Is it a good thing or bad? I, I think if, if what we mean by saying we're looking at the judiciary as a political institution is that we're looking at it as a forum for partisan activity, I think that's a very negative thing. And I think it's counter to my own experience, um, both in the state and the federal system. I wouldn't go so far as to say that we, we should deny that our individual life experiences cause us to bring perspectives to the judging that we do, because I think that's unrealistic. But in my experience, what I like about appellate judging is it's a team sport, right? I've always, I've always done better in team sports than, than individual sports, uh, if, partly because I can sit on the bench there too, just like now. But, um, <laughs> but um, I, I, it gives us an opportunity to learn from each other's perspectives. Um, and I, and I, I, don't, I don't bristle at the notion that judges have perspectives and have life experiences. Um, I sometimes tense up when we attribute rulings to that without getting into the weeds of what was the legal issue. You know, like if, if, if the ruling is in favor of one kind of party versus another and you attribute to life experience, but the issue was like some arcane statutory issue, you know, sometimes those connections don't make sense. Sometimes they might, I don't know. but. So in terms of uh, good thing, bad thing, and what was the other, was good thing, bad thing was sort of a little bit of a hedgy answer. And then the, was there oh. another part of that question? Is there a way that we can combat this perceived notion that the judiciary is a um, politically motivated institution? Yeah, I mean, I think obviously we in the judiciary have to do our part to walk the walk. Um, and I think these kinds of forums are helpful opportunities to you know, sort of engage in this conversation. I do think the media has a role in, in the way that we, we mentioned. Um, 
and I guess I'd, I'd like to see, you know, I think sometimes um, leaders in the political sphere may inadvertently contribute to that in terms of the way they talk about the judiciary. And, I, you know, I, that's a reality. And, I, and I'm not, people have their own roles and own jobs to do, so I don't want to tell other people how to talk. But I think overall, I, I, I think you all as leaders, um, as leaders now and, and, and ahead, uh, I don't think you should feel shy about holding the judiciary's feet to the fire. I'm not saying give us a free pass. Um, but I, I, I hope that you can talk about things in a nuanced way that, that doesn't undermine the sort of project of the judiciary. Thank you. Thank you for that great question. Um, I usually ask a final question about advice for students, but you have been giving students advice all day. <laughs> so I'm gonna ask a, a legal uh, question to, to conclude. And, and before doing so, um, because Joanne will, will yell at me if I don't, I, I will uh, announce that the next Rocky lecture <laughs> is uh, next Monday at 5 p.m. with Bill Barrow of the Associated Press speaking about American democracy. Nice. Final question. I'm, I'm curious about your theory of judicial error correction and, and, and large-scale legal change um, for the following reason, which is a lot of the discussion of statutory interpretation and construction that we've just had um, sort of has this, this Dworkinian element of a, of a chain novel or sort of a, a, a series of precedents through which you draw the best fit line. And suppose we wake up one day and we realize that, that that series of precedents, that chain novel, has systematically erred in some way. We need a sort of background theory of, of legal change and, and legal error correction, and I'm wondering what, what yours is. Yeah, I'm, you know, I'm not a scholar, and I can't say, oh, here's my background theory of legal correction, error correction. It's hard when you're talking about statutes, because the statute interpreta interpretation of statutes is a conversation between the legislative branch and the judicial branch. And to a large extent, I think we rely on the legislature or Congress to tell the courts when they're getting it wrong or they've gotten it wrong. I think it's, it's hard to change, to say the statute, here's what the statute means, and then uh, go another direction if the legislature hasn't spoken. So I, I, I wouldn't want to, and maybe that is my theory. I mean, it's, it's, it's a theory in which the courts have a role in a broader conversation, but there are two other branches in the mix. and. Uh, I think the courts have a lot of responsibility and therefore um, power and power to affect change in some settings, but they're also very limited in their in their mission and their mandate and sort of how they exercise the, 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 the authority they have. Please join me in thanking Judge Robinson. Thank you. Thank you all very much. It's very nice. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you. That probably Thank wasn't you. a very satisfying answer. No, of course it is. <laughs>